Perfect. <clears throat> so thank you very much, Taisa. So uh, good morning, everyone, uh, at least uh, in Europe. Uh, so um, uh, I'm very pleased to to start this uh, uh, session of uh, this last day um, of the Delve uh, conference. Um, and just uh, as a, a usual uh, reminder for the participants, uh, there is a there is a Slack channel where uh, you can uh, post the questions uh, after the, the end of, um, of the presentation or continue the discussions. Uh, and also <coughs> there are uh, the Slack, uh, the posters available in uh, the Gather Town uh, website, where, which is a very nice uh, site to, to go around and see the different uh, posters. So um, I think that's, that's, I did not forget too much, Taisa, am I correct? <laughs> that's everything you need to cover. Okay, good. Um, so now we will have a, a, a session uh, that is uh, uh, mainly on uh, supergiants, on red supergiants. Uh, and we will start with a, a presentation by Rajiv Manik uh, about uh, a long period binary in a bipolar proto uh, pre planetary nebula. So, uh, thank you, and you can start, uh, Rajiv. Thanks, thanks, Pia. Uh, just start my timer. It's okay. So yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Rajiv. I'm a Claude Leon postdoc at the South African Astronomical Observatory. So I would like to first thank the group of organizers for, for giving me the opportunity to present my work in such a nice virtual conference. I would also like to mention the collaborators that are listed here in this, in this, who have contributed in this project. So yeah, um, as I said, I would like to present uh, um, my recent work on, on this pre-PN, which is IRAS 08005. And um, as you can see in this nice HST image of the system, uh, it has a nice bipolar morphology. The central star is here. And uh, if you look at this false color image of this system, you see that uh, they, they, there are hints of jets in the system coming from the central source, but also uh, some dark region uh, hinting towards some sort of disk uh, torus in the waste. Okay, so uh, before uh, presenting my results, I would like to um, give a brief overview of the, the the evolution of low to intermediate mass stars on the HR diagram. So, uh, so these are stars with a mass of 0 0.8 to around eight solar masses. So once they, they leave the main sequence, they start the giant branch evolution. I won't go into the details, but that was the very end of the, uh, of the evolution. They go through an AGB phase where the stars lose mass by powerful, powerful winds driven by stellar pulsations or can be by interaction with another star in, in four binary systems. And then they will shred out the outer envelope and they will chemi chemically enrich the star, okay? so. This chemically enriched star would, you know, once once the AGB would, would be terminated by the AGB superwind, it would evolve off the AGB to become a post-AGB star. And then the surface of the post-AGB star is expected to retain signatures of the AGB nucleosynthesis, so the S process and the C-rich material. So uh, the star will, you know, so at, at the post-AGB stage, you have essentially the core, which is just a white dwarf surrounded by the AGB remnant. And then the star will eventually evolve towards high temperatures at constant luminosity. And it will go through a pre-planetary nebula phase, which we, which is some, somewhere around here with these temperatures. And then eventually after reaching around 3,500 Kelvin uh, effective temperatures, it will enter the central star of planetary nebula phase and eventually dying as a white dwarf. So when we trace back the evolution on the HRD, so these central stars, so the CSPNE, are, are believed to be to have gone through a pre-PN phase, to have gone through a post-AGB phase and AGB phase, okay? 
But um, the main challenge here is that, that these systems don't link, that don't link very well um, on, the, on the observational basis at least. So um, the chemistry, the orbital properties, not that really well understood. And also I have to mention here that uh, this is a traditional picture of, evol of evolution of these stars, but, uh, but uh, it is good to note that um, a lot of these, the, the evolution of these stars actually are, 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 you know, are, are influenced by binary interactions, which we don't really understand at the fundamental basis. Okay, so, um, Looking at the, 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 you know, at the very end of this evolution, we see, look at this planetary nebulae. I'm sure you've seen these pictures before. Uh, and what you can already see that um, these, these, the P and E have you know, a variety of shapes. So you can see the spherical shapes, and then you have the more asymmetric ones. There's elliptical, the bipolar, point symmetric shapes. And, um, Producing these shapes has been um, one of the main focus. Uh, understanding the, 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 how these shapes are formed has been one of the main focus in the in evolved stars research. And uh, now it is reaching, uh, I mean, the main consensus, consensus is that a binary interaction is needed to produce these shapes. Okay, But the, the binary interaction itself is not really well understood. Even if we look at the, 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 on the other end of this, uh, of this evolution, we look at the AGB systems. This is uh, a recent imaging survey by, of circumstellar material around AGB stars using ALMA CO imaging. And uh, as you can see here also in this mosaic that you see these very weird asymmetrical shapes, okay? Here I'm showing the results of this in the lane, lane's result from K11, which was published in 2020 in Science. And um, yeah, again, so you can already see that, you know, you don't see these nice spherical structures in these systems, but you see these spiral structures, uh, density enhancements, disc-like geometries and whatnot. So um, even, you know, at, at the earlier stage, we think that, you know, these, these structures or more easier produced by binary interaction. Uh, so yeah, but the exact model is the exact mechanism of the binary interaction in the total industry, as I said. So looking at the models, what did they predict? Um, earlier models um, predict that, you know, you need short orbital period systems. So the, the common envelope, the systems which go through a common envelope phase. So in this in this phase, you would have the companion which will be anchored by the by, by the by the envelope of the primary star, and then due to some accretion onto the companion and some angular momentum uh, exchange, you will have this envelope injection, in in mostly in in preferred directions, which are the bi in the polar directions, and you would create these you know these bipolar outflows. And even uh, newer models by Garcia, Secura, et al. 2020 show that uh, now you, you probably need an, a, a, like a, 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 an interaction between magnetic field and the binarity to actually produce these, these bipolar structures, but also to collimate these, these um, outflows at the very you know, center, close to the, close to the central star. So uh, to complement these models, observationally, what has been done? Well, um, looking at you know at the planetary nebulae, um, there have been surveys, photometric surveys from Ogle, which were which were used to to find these binaries in these the post common envelope binaries in these systems, and a seminal work by Michal Skieta, two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine, showed that. Around 20% of these, uh, you know, the PNE are should be binaries. Okay. Uh, these these uh, binaries were detected by photometric variability, so from eclipses, ellipsoidal vari variations, and irradiation effects. But one thing to note here is that um, the, this study was biased towards the shorter orbital period ones. You know, uh, so. Um, now it is only now when we look well. Uh, if we look at the the, the, the binary 
orbital period um, distribution of these PNE. It is only now that we are try we are finding the longer orbital period ones. So, for example, NGC 1360 and the other ones with the long longer orbital periods uh, are being found by our radial velocity monitoring. So, thanks to all these, you know, long term. Uh, radial velocity monitoring programs that we are, we are starting to find to look at the you know the bigger picture of the distribution of these the 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 the, uh, the PNE the orbital periods of the PNE. So one interesting questions that we ask ourselves in the you know in the linking of these system uh, of of these post AGP AGP and PNE pre PNE systems how are they linked? So um, so uh, one thing to, you know, we try to link them on different bases, like the orbital properties, chemical um, properties, and circumstellar properties. So uh, before going into the link, I would like to give a short overview of the post-HGP system. So these, the, there's the post-HGP binaries, which uh, Jacques gave in us talk on the first day. So these are, these are the post-HGP systems, which are which called the disk post-HGP systems and what we see there is um, these show a nice uh, a, a nice the, the SED which looks like this so you see a, a, a an infrared excess starting at around two microns which is indicating the presence of hot dust in this system and then these systems are known to uh, to harbor a circum binary disk and indeed we we VLT the interferometric imaging, we see that indeed these systems have a disk. So this is the emission from the disk that you see around the star. And the, the inner rim of the, these disks are regulated by the, the, the sublimation temperature. Okay. Uh, this is showing another, you know, long-term uh, radio velocity monitoring work from, you know, Hans and, and people in KV Leuven. So, um, here we are showing the orbital properties of these post binaries. So we know by now that all the disk sources, so the, the sources which show it second binary disk are all binaries. The typical periods are around 100 to 3,000 days. Some are quite eccentric, okay? And around 33 orbits of these are known by now, okay? But when we look at the orbital uh, period distribution. These are, you know, longer periods than, you know, the post common envelope binaries that I showed you earlier in the uh, uh, pre, uh, in the uh, PNE stage. So the connection is not very well established in there, at least on the orbital uh, properties. So what we also see in these post binaries is for the talk of Dylan. Uh, two days ago, so you see this appearance of these jets. So at some phases of these, uh, in the in the orbit, you would see this double peak emission in the spectra in the H alpha profile. While at some phases, you would see this P signal like profile with extended blue absorption. Okay, so we know that now this is the signature of a jet, and these jet can reach to velocities up to 500 kilometers per second in these systems. So what we think is happening is that. Um, at, 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 the, at phases of superior conjunction when the primary luminous primary is, is at the back and you have the companion in between the observer and the primary, we are looking through the jet, which is causing these, you know, the, 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 the p signal like profiles. So this is what is known in these, in these systems. So uh, one one of the focus of Evo Vista's research is to understand how these systems are actually connected. Uh, so how are these, you know, PNE, the orbits of the PNE are connected to the post-HG binaries? Um, so we want to know the, the orbital evolution between these systems. The chemical evolution is not very well linked. Uh, the circumstellar material evolution is not very well linked as well among several other uh, challenges that um, we don't understand. And this, for the chemical uh, evolution, there was a talk of Devika a few days ago. So this is why some studies have been trying to look at an intermediate phase between the post HGP binaries and the, and the central star or primary nebulae, so which is the pre-planetary nebulae phase, okay? 
So um, just a just to mention, just to give a little overview of these systems. So these are stores that have stopped large scale uh, AGB mass loss. And now, but they are not hot enough to ionize their, their material to look at, to, 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 to glow as a PN, but they, they, sh they, they, they still have a nebulae, an optical nebulae, and which is show, which is seen in the scattered light. So these systems also show an infrared access at longer wavelength, and um, which is, which is, uh, which we think is the CO emission of AD, uh, which is the AGB remnant material around them. So as you can see, these systems, you know, the, 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 if you look at these pre planetary nebulae, they are not very too distinct from the planetary nebulae in terms of shapes. And one would think that probably these should be also be driven by binarity. Okay, so this was actually the, the work of Bruce Hivnak um, for you know quite a long time to actually look at these pre-planetary nebulae, the ones which have you know these pointing towards binarity, and to see whether uh, we we find the binaries in them. So what the result was, you know, was quite, you know, we, we didn't really find uh, enough, um, you know, variability in the data set to be able to, to, to um, attribute these to binarity. So the conclusion there was probably these are not binaries, but probably white binaries. So there are a few known binaries in pre p &E, arguably. So these are, these pre p &E, they, they show nebulosity, but you also see, show a uh, characteristic of post AGB binary. So they also have a disk and things. Uh, so these are the, you know, the, 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 the objects that are known binaries in the pre p &E stage. So the, the point of this slide is to show you that not many uh, binaries are known in the pre p &E stage as, as, as compared to the post AGB binary and the any binaries, okay? So one question um, we ask whether these are really intrinsically rare objects or, you know, or whether, whether, whether binarity is rare in these systems. So motivated by this, we, we, we you know, we included this object in our radial velocity monitoring. So some of the main property, properties of the objects which were linking towards binarity were bipolar morphology, of course. And then we saw, we, we, we saw a long-term photometric variability in the, in the light curve. So this was one of the motivation also to, to, to include this object in our radio velocity monitoring. And among other, some other uh, observational properties as well. So the monitoring was done at Seoul, so in South Africa, but also we gathered some more archival data from CTIO, VLT, and the uh, WHT. So what we found is that actually this is actually is a, a binary. So I'm showing you here 20 years of radio velocity data. So most of the data were taken quite recently, but then you have the you know the older data which are which I'm showing here. And this is turns out to be a binary, quite a long period binary around 2,654 2, days. And we see that the orbit is quite eccentric as well, 0.36 eccentricity. And using an inclination of 60 degrees, which we got from the literature, we, uh, we were able to find, to constrain the companion mass to be around 0.63 uh, solar masses. Uh, I'm also presenting, you know, the near infrared photometry of this object, which was taken by Patricia and colleagues. And this is showing you 24 years of near infrared data from the SAO 1.9 and 0.75 telescopes. And even there, we see a mean period of around 27, 27 days, which is consistent with what we find with the radio velocity. So what we think is probably happening there is that there's, there's differential heating by the you know by the eccentric motion of the star on the on the on the circumbinary disk. What we also see in this system is that the presence of jets. So um, as in the post AGB binary, so you see at, at some phases in the blue blue uh, curves, we see the H alpha profiles at phases of superior conjunction. So what happens there is that you, you're seeing an, an extended uh, absorption feature 
are superior conjunctions. So we, what we think we are, we think we are seeing through the jet. And I would like to come back here to this image. So probably, you know, it probably the jets are probably linked to this you know, extended feature in this in this HST. But um, yeah. And what we think it could these jets could also be supplying the primary force to to actually you know uh, uh, shape these 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 systems into bipolar structures as such. So uh, I would like to show you the bigger picture of what we are what we are aiming at in this in this um, in this research. So uh, we want to actually get the 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 the, the the orbital distribution of these pre PNE and compare them to the PNE and and with the post HGP binaries and see maybe that could help models to kind of see you know to to predict the binary evolution <coughs> uh, in the post HGP phase. So by now we 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 are trying to populate this. We already have IRAS 08005. We have another interesting object which is Frostileo. This is uh, this is in preparation. And uh, yeah, so um, looking forward, we have identified a few more um, interesting pre planetary nebulae with, with, with you know, um, observational features that are pointing towards binarity. So bipolar, there's, there's you know, long term photometric variability, as you can see in this, in this table here. They have quite long term photometric variability. So this is really uh, this kind of, you know, it's a research that it's really like an arts work. So it, it takes time to, to find these binaries. But uh, I think the future looks, you know, promising in terms of uh, finding more binaries in this. And probably, you know, finding more of these binaries will give us a bit more of the statistics um, in these objects in terms of the orbits and things. So yeah, uh, I would like to summarize my talk here. So we found the longest period binary in a pre pn um, We also find the presence of jets in this system. Okay, so the bigger picture is that we don't really understand the orbital parameters of this pre pn -E. So actually long-term radio velocity is, is needed to, to, to obtain those. And um, one more thing is that when we look at binaries in the pre pne we have to look at the ones which have, uh, you know, which, which give the, you know, point towards binarity. So the long-term periodic variation in the photometry, bipolar outflows, probably this and things. So yeah, thank you. I would be happy to take any questions if you have. Thank you very much, uh, Rajiv. This was uh, extremely interesting and uh, remarkable to, to see such long uh, series of uh, observations and the successful detection of binaries. That's uh, really uh, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there questions for uh, Rajiv? <coughs> I don't see one for the moment. I would have one. Um, yep. When you are looking at a very long time series of photometry and radial velocity, uh, how do you disentangle between a possible pulsation of a star and the presence of a companion? Yeah. So yeah, that's yeah, that's good. But so what 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 we we so so for example in the radial velocities. If, if you would have pulsations, then if you integrate below the curve, uh, you would be able to tell, you know, the linear, the, 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 the motion, you would be able to tell in terms of AU, how much, you know, what, what distance, how do you say? So what, what sort of distances of the pulsations that you're looking at, right? So if, if you integrate, but I think what we are seeing here in the radial velocities is not pulsations, but if you integrate below the curve, they, you know you would you would see thousands of AUs, and that is that probably is not pulsations. We think so. It's it's the true var orbital variation of the star. Yes, so indeed the, the periods are so long. I mean, it's yeah, difficult yeah. to imagine a pulsation yeah. like that. Yeah. Thank you. Are there, oh yes, there's a question by uh, uh, Patricia. Uh, 
right look. So please ask your question. Uh, thank you, Rajiv. I wonder if you like to fit uh, symbiotic stars into the PPN post AGB pattern because there's always been a fuss made about how they aren't planetary nebulae, but they so very much the same sort of lines. They have uh, they have mixed periods from a few hundred to a few thousand and more days, uh, and, and often involve white dwarfs and and red. AGB stars. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I'm not sure, but are these like F, G, and K spectral types? Also, like luminosity class one objects? Because there are a few uh, F and G stars, but the majority of them have um, M type, a few have C type spectra. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, Probably we'll have to look at the SEDs and classify them and probably look at the luminosity classes. So there's still probably some work to be done there. I don't know. But yeah, I haven't really looked at uh, you know, the symbiotics um, as such. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I don't see uh, any other questions. So thank you very much, Rajiv, for this yeah, very, thanks, very yeah. Nice uh, review uh, and presentation. Thanks. So um, now we will uh, welcome uh, uh, Lee Patrick uh, to tell us about the multiplicity properties of uh, red supergiant stars, which is, of course, a very important topic. So please, Lee, if you want. Uh, yeah, so can I, I ask? Thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to sort of present some of our recent work about the multiplicity properties of red supergiant stars. Now, I sort of assume you can all see and hear me well, because no one's sort of diving in and telling me to stop, which is just great perfect. news. It's perfect. Yeah. Thanks. So the, the, the sort of image I'm showing you here is, the, is, is, is of the Magellanic Clouds. And that's because a lot of our recent work is sort of focused on... Uh, on the red supergiant populations of the large and the small Magellanic clouds. And that's sort of what I'll sort of present to you today about. Let me just, okay. Oh, oh, now then, what's happened there? Just give me one second, sorry about that. I'm not 100% certain why that happens, but I have seen it happen before. Okay, so I, I think I'm all, you're all back with me. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is the multiplicity properties of red supergiant stars. So in a, in a, in a pretty similar vein to what Ranjif has been, has been sort of talking about there, using radio velocity studies in particular to identify binary motions. So <clears throat> I'm going to try and motivate this study from the point of view of understanding the evolution of massive stars. I'll then talk about some of our sort of theoretical expectations of red supergiant populations. And then I'll talk about how we can test these, these expectations using, in particular, young massive star clusters in the, in the Magellanic Clouds, where we identify what we term red straggler stars. We determine the binary fraction of red supergiants in clusters and the minimum binary fraction in the Magellanic Clouds in general. And we're beginning to be able to characterize these systems. So massive stars are sort of uniquely important for stellar feedback throughout their lives as they uh, eject material through stellar winds and as they explode by a core collapse supernova. And in particular, binary massive stars are progenitors to things like double compact objects, which eventually go on to produce gravitational wave events. So in my mind, that gives massive stars a sort of unique importance among, among the understanding of, or well, for the understanding of, of, of stellar and galactic astrophysics. And the multiplicity properties of, of massive stars are one of the key uncertainties in understanding uh, massive star evolution in general. And we now think that most massive stars start their lives with a companion. And much work has sort of gone into the initial phases of stellar evolution, focusing on sort of main sequence massive stars, where we think around sort of 70 to up to 90% of these stars are born with a companion. 
but much less is known about the endpoints of stellar evolution. And that's particularly true of the red supergiant phase, where sort of the majority of massive stars end their lives as red supergiant stars before exploding as, as supernova. And the effects of multiplicity are really quite wide reaching and have sort of serious implications for each of the individual components of the binary system. And they produce things like all these sort of exotic different, uh, different types of stars, things like common envelope evolution and strip stars, things like rejuvenated stars, uh, the sort of massive analogs of blue straggler stars in globular clusters. And by sort of uh, supernova explosions taking place within binary systems produce things like runaway and walkaway stars where the, where the sort of remaining star gets a little kick and either sort of runs or walks away from its original position. And the effects of the sort of multiplicity of massive stars give rise to things like the distribution of the observed core collapse supernova. So multiplicity is really important, I think. <laughs> and in the red supergiant phase, these two figures from Eldritch et al. 2008 show a very similar thing to what Emily was showing yesterday in, uh, in, in her talk where essentially any sort of interaction within a binary system is pretty bad news for red supergiants because it, 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 so this is the sort of single star models and these are the, the, uh, the binary star models. When you can see the lifetime of the red supergiant population is much decreased and actually the, the sort of distribution of initial masses also changes a little bit. So that, that it has some really important consequences for red supergiant populations. So what we sort of went away and done is, is simulate red supergiant populations using the combined code. Now, these are two graphics that I'm sort of showing from this fantastic simulation that Christoph Schumann has produced, which assumes a sort of binary fraction on the main sequence of one exactly. So you can sort of kind of scale these numbers depending on your preferred main sequence binary fraction of massive stars. Now this pie chart, shows uh, essentially the composition of the red supergiant population. And what's really striking to me is that we think, assuming a binary fraction of main sequence on, of one, of course, the, uh, the fraction of red supergiants that are produced from binary interactions is around 75%. And that's sort of built up of uh, around 50% of stars that have previously merged in a binary system and then evolved to the red supergiant phase as well as these systems that have been disrupted by a supernova within the binary system. Now, sort of similar to what Emily was saying yesterday about their sort of simulations or their uh, predictions of, of, of red supergiants in binary systems, when we look at the breakdown of this simulated population of red supergiants in binary systems, we find that the vast majority are main sequence stars. And that sort of ties in to with, with what we know from red supergiant binary systems in the galaxy and what we're sort of beginning to identify now. And you also see a sort of lesser uh, frequency of these sort of compact object systems and white dwarf and white dwarf red supergiant binary systems, as well as some red supergiant red supergiant binary systems, although they're particularly rare. So how can we test these theoretical expectations. Now, one of the ways we can do this, I think one of the, well, among the best ways we can do this, in my opinion, is to use young massive clusters, and in particular in the, in the Magellanic clouds. Now, young massive clusters in the sort of right age and mass range produce large populations of red supergiants. And these two in particular, NGC 330 in the, in the small Magellanic Cloud and NGC 2100 in the large Magellanic Cloud uh, have around sort of 20 red supergiants each, which is you know, a pretty substantial population to study things like binary evolution. And in these clusters, using the distribution of the luminosities of these red supergiants, we identified that around 50% of these red supergiants are actually binary interaction products are the direct result from mergers on the main sequence that have evolved into the red supergiant phase. Which again was, was, a, was a kind of surprising result for me, if I'm, if I'm totally honest. And 
if we sort of focus in on NGC 330 now, which is our SMC example of a, of a sort of, you know, fixed red supergiant population, using multi-epoch radio velocity studies, so using radio velocity monitoring spanning uh, a baseline of, a, of a sort of around 450 days, we are able to determine the binary fraction of red supergiants in this cluster of around 30 plus or minus 10%. Now, because of the limitations of the observations, this is only sensitive to a very specific range of, of orbital configurations. And that's really important to have in mind that these observations or any, any observations in general have sort of intrinsic biases that need to be taken into account in order to, to sort of tell us about the intrinsic uh, properties of the, of the stars. And these, uh, these results sort of tie in really quite nicely with some of the some of the sort of contemporary results in in external galaxies and sort of much older results in the in in the galaxy as well. And now, if we sort of zoom out from uh, this this star cluster and look at the large and the small Magellanic clouds in general, we've recently compiled radial velocity measurements for all, for around about a thousand red supergiants in these galaxies spanning a, a baseline of around 40 years. Now, this is these this com, this comprises of sort of several different uh, individual studies that have sort of studied the stellar population of the Magellanic Clouds. And what we've done here is calibrated all of these different studies, which is what I'm showing in these histograms, to the Gaia radial velocity rest frame. So we sort of calibrate all of these individual studies to take into account things like intrinsic biases between the different studies. And this actually works really quite well. And by doing this, we're able to then look at the radio velocity variability of these red supergiants spanning a baseline of around 40 years. And we're able to identify binary motion that cannot be explained as a result of atmospheric variability. And by doing this, we place a lower limit on the red supergiant multiplicity fraction of around 15 plus or minus 3%. That doesn't seem to change depending on these two distinct metallicity environments. Now, through this work, we identify uh, 45 red supergiant binaries by sort of directly detecting their binary motion. I'll, I'll come back to those guys in a second. But really, we want to go further than that. What we, want to, what we really want to do is to characterize the systems and, and understand, well, A, the evolutionary status of these, of these red supergiant binary systems, and B, the fate, the ult what, ultimately what's going to happen to these systems. And one of, the, one of the systems that we're studying in detail is B31 in the NGC 330 Young Massive Cluster in the SMC. Now, this is a, a really interesting system, and you can see from this figure of its sort of radial velocity curve, where the black points are the, the red supergiant, that there's really quite a pronounced radial velocity variation. So we, we see around a variation of, uh, of, of, of around 50 kilometers per second for this red supergiant component. And sort of added to that, we from the, the H-alpha profile, we determine the uh, motion of the secondary which is essentially the only um, spectral signature of the secondary in really quite detailed uh, and high signal, well, reasonable signal and high spectroscopy that we've got. So we currently think this system is, is something similar to the VVSEP binary system in the, in the, in the galaxy, which is a, a red supergiant plus a B-type star that has a, an accretion disk surrounding it. And we think this pronounced sort of double peaked H alpha emission profile is evidence of this accretion disk surrounding the companion. And this, uh, this system has a sort of period of around 450 days. And the mass of the red supergiant component, we, we think is about seven solar masses. So right on the cusp of, of what you'd expect a red supergiant to be in this, in this sort of chemical environment. And the, the companion mass looks to be around sort of 13 or 14 solar masses, so a mass ratio of around 1.9. So th this is a really interesting system, and it's an example of how we're beginning to characterize these systems. 
So another way where we're doing this is coming back to the figure that I showed you before, which is of the, the sort of radial velocity, uh, the maximum radial velocity difference in this red, uh, LMC and SMC population of red supergiants. So if we focus on the SMC population of red supergiants and go away and sort of cross match all of these, uh, all of these confirmed binary systems from Dorada and Patrick in 2021, if we sort of cross match those systems with UV IT uh, photometry from uh, sort of UV IT AstroSat data, which is sort of just coming out now and it's almost complete, you can see from this sort of patchy, patchy uh, footprint here. So if we match those two observations, what we have is direct detection of the companions in the UV combined with the radial velocity difference or the radial velocities that we've detected for the red supergiant component. So in this way, where we're sort of we're sort of beginning to characterize the systems, and with the UV photometry, we're able to place mass limits on these systems, which starts to allow us to determine the orbital parameters and of the of these systems. So that was a I feel like really quite a whirlwind uh, tour of what of some of the recent work we've been doing, but just to sort of conclude. The multiplicity properties of red supergiants have really quite important consequences for things like supernova rates and the production of double compact object systems. I've sort of shown you some theoretical expectations of uh, red supergiant populations, and we've tested these expectations by identifying stars that we term red straggler stars in around uh, and that have a prevalence of around 50% in cluster populations. We've determined the red supergiant binary fraction to be around 15 to 30% in the Magellanic clouds in sort of various different environments. And that ties in really quite well with uh, some, some, some contemporary work using a completely different observational method, as well as some older work in, in the galaxy. Um, and we're beginning to characterize the systems. We're beginning to understand more about what types of, of binary systems these are. And this is essential to understand the, the evolutionary status of these red supergiants and their ultimate fate. So how will these stars end their lives effectively? But this, given the sort of restrictions in orbital periods that are imposed by the size of the red supergiants, this is quite a difficult thing to do, to detect red supergiants and binary systems in general. So, you know, we're sort of getting there, but uh, still a lot of work to go. So thank you very much for listening and uh, I'm happy to take sort of any questions. Thank you very much, Lee. It was a really uh, ex exceptional. I mean, so I was very impressed and I learned a lot from, from your talk, thank you. So there's a, a question by uh, Zeng Kaihan. So please go ahead. Thank you, great talk. Uh, I would ask a question about their formation. Are the secondaries in RSG binaries that we see today old tertiaries or new companions? Well, that's a really good question because, of course, we expect higher order multiple systems to be really quite prevalent in this in this population. So it, it's and given the sort of wide orbital periods, that's sort of exactly what one expects for two stars in a sort of close binary system to merge and then be sort of surrounded by this, uh, well, in a much larger system with, with, red super giant, with a red supergiant companion. So, I mean, it's, it's really difficult to sort of test that, that um, scenario observationally because, well, at the minute, we're sort of just on the cusp of being able to distinguish red supergiant binaries in general. So being able to sort of distinguish tertiary systems is, is really quite tricky. But we do think we have done it in one specific case in the in our this sort of recent um, the re this recent paper where we identify sort of binary motion from uh, from the this Magellanic cloud sample. So there is one system that appears to be a triple system, but of course this needs this needs much more characterization. At the minute, we've only got a really limited number of observations for this star. So things are ongoing, but 
yeah, I certainly expect there to be a large fraction of these stars actually in, in, in triple and higher order systems. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there uh, another question? No? Well, I, I would have one, one quick question. Uh, I was particularly impressed by the, the, the detection that you find of about 15 to 20 to 30 percent uh, binary fraction among the RSGs in, in the Magellanic clouds. Uh, I had this image in mind that uh, uh, these massive stars were always binaries, and actually it's not the case. And that's, that's very important uh, to, to understand that the merger had such an importance in the evolution so that's uh yeah yeah i think that's that's something that's that's a really important thing to have in 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 mind that you know typically the the sort of massive star binary fraction is assumed to be i mean essentially one you know it's essentially 100 percent. but it, here what i think we're doing is probing how that evolution how that how binary evolution changes over time i mean because of the sort of physical size of the red supergiant we expect that star to have kind of swallowed up stars, potentially sort of swallowed up a, a close, a binary, a close binary companion, and that essentially rules out uh, a lot of the close binary systems. So yeah, so what we think we're probing, we think we're probing binary evolution in in practice here, but yeah. A lot of work needs to go into so the, the, the sort of quantitative comparison between what we're observing in the red supergiant phase and that earlier evolutionary phases. So in, in NGC 330, for example, uh, we actually think the sort of close, the sort of most recent estimate of the multiplicity of B-type stars in this, in this cluster is actually kind of also similar to around 30%. Which is really quite unexpected. That's really not what we expected to observe. One would expect a, a, a sort of main sequence binary fraction much closer to one to have a red supergiant binary fraction of around 30%. So I think there's there's a lot of work to go in to sort of understand what's going on here. And I feel like we're really at the cusp of something of, of a of a sort of big step in our understanding of this of this evolutionary phase. Yes, thank you very much, Lee, for this very interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, now we will uh, welcome uh, Holly Andrews for a presentation about the molecular content of the outflows of the red supergiants NML Cygni. Perfect, it's working fine. You just have to unmute your microphone. Yeah, can you hear me? Perfect, thank you. Okay, great, let's get started then. So hi everyone, my name is Holly Andrews. Uh, I'm currently based at Chalmers University of Technology. Um, and as said, I'm gonna be talking to you all today about the molecular content of the outflows of the red supergiant NML Cygni. Um, I just wanna take a moment before I get started to thank the organizers for allowing me to speak about one of my favorite objects in the night sky. Um, and thanks for such an amazing conference so far. Okay. okay, so we've already had a bit of an introduction from Lee earlier about the many motivations in why red supergiants are such key and important objects for us to understand. Um, and I just want to mention a bit more about why these are such a key stage in massive stellar evolution, especially for massive stars, which start off with an initial mass of, you know, that usual boundary of eight to 10, all the way up to 40 solar masses. And this is because these red supergiants experience such strong mass loss rates um, with mass loss rates from 10 to the minus five, all the way up to up to 10 to the minus three solar masses per year. And these really are, as Lee said earlier, an important source of chemical and mechanical feedback, not just for their surroundings, but also impacting their later stages of their evolution as well, as the mass lost during these phases can determine the types of stellar remnants we then see at the end of these massive stars' lifetimes. 
Um, but there's a lot of lack of understanding of the full picture of red supergiants. Uh, this includes understanding the effects of binarity, as has been mentioned earlier on in this conference, but also the underlying driving force behind the stellar winds. Often we make assumptions or approximations, or we believe it's to do with perhaps something like dust driven winds or convection, but they're not really fully understood. Um, and so my work has been motivated by trying to look at the circumstellar environments where we see this chemical and mechanical feedback to try and understand more about these stars by looking at their stellar winds. So I'm particularly interested and I'm going to talk to you today about NML SIG, which is an M-type red supergiant. It's located about 1.6 kiloparsecs away in the Cygnus X, X region. And it's had many previous studies. Um, so for example, the dust scattered light using the HST or MESA emission, or even looking at some of its molecular emission previously. And all of these prior studies have shown evidence for interactions between its ejector and environment and that there are asymmetries. So one example of this is the image I've included here from Schuster et al. 2006, which is of HST imaging, where you can see this asymmetric bean type shape around the star. So it's clear that there's much more going on here and much more to understand. Um, so this is why it's motivated that this object, NML SIG, was one that we were interested in looking at to look at its molecular content and that it has already been seen to have a rich molecular content in its environment previously. So our observations were secured with the Onsler 20 meter radio telescope back in 2016. Um, so there was a spectral scan survey done of NML SIG uh, ranging from 68 to 116 gigahertz. So in the longer wavelength regime using uh, a three millimeter and four millimeter receiver, which was split over 16 different frequency tunings, um, each with a bandwidth of four gigahertz. And there was various overlaps in the difference of the frequency tunings. Um, but we were really able to look at a very large range of wavelengths to see really what we could pick up around this star. So what were the results? So when we looked at the results from this spectral scan, we actually found new detections for 15 different um, emission lines from 10 molecular species and isotopologues. Um, so this is from data that's moved to a spectral resolution of four kilometers per second with noise range of around five to 10 millikelvin. And in fact, this was the first detection that we secured for the isotopologue of HCM H13CN which was detected in the J equals one to zero rotational transition. Aside from this, our detections were primarily of sulfur and silicon bearing species, as has been seen for this star before. And as well as this, we were able to secure yet more CO lines. So this star has already been detected with several CO lines from previous observations, but we were able to pick up the ground state J equals one to zero rotational transition for both 13 CO and CO as well. Um, but one thing that struck us when we were looking at these line profiles, and I'll get to them in a moment, was that the shape of the line profiles actually de deviated a little bit from what we would expect for a simple spherical wind, including an excess of blue shifted emission in many of the line profiles. And this actually motivated our attempts to take a first look at whether multiple component fits would be a more apt way to understand the line profiles that we were seeing from all of these different uh, mission lines. So we then uh, got hold of the archival data, including those CO lines, as I mentioned earlier, from the JCMT, um, as previously published in Debecca al 2010, as well as some Herschel Hi-Fi data um, previously published in Tessier et al 2012. And we decided to look at the swathe of different molecular species and transition lines to understand if we could see any qualitative trends with sort of a first, um, a first look using multiple components. And so this included investigating uh, both CO, 13 CO, but also SIO and some isotopologues, um, and also ortho and para water lines, SO and SO2. And although we only had single line detections for some of the other species, including H13CN, which was our new detection earlier, we were also able to apply our fitting procedure to those as well. Although we didn't use a deeper investigation into those because we only had a single molecular line. 
So our multi-component fits were very much just a first uh, assumption of an approximation. So we applied a three Gaussian fit, um, obviously a non-physical assumption, but just so we could split things up into a blue shifted component, a red central component, and a red shifted component in our different line profiles. From this, we were able to gain measures of fit parameters for velocity whips for each of our components as well as central and mean velocity values and peak temperatures as well. And from this, for the lines, uh, for the molecular species and isotopologues for which we had multiple emission lines available, we could then consider whether there were any changes or trends depending on their velocity whips, their velocity values, and also their normalized line strengths. So the integrated intensity values that we got out for both the blue shifted and the red shifted components um, when normalized to the central component as well. So just here as an overview, these are the lines that we detected using the Onsler 20 meter radio telescope. I don't have time, unfortunately, in my talk to go through every single one, um, but the data and everything will hopefully be submitted later this year. Um, but I'm just gonna highlight a few of the different molecular species that we did investigate and talk a bit about the general trends that we see an indication of as well as some of the limitations inherent in this very simple fit that we applied, just as a first look at what we're seeing. So uh, one of the species we could look at with multiple lines was DO. Um, as you can see, there were some uh, complications in our fitting procedure due to the ISM uh, both emission spikes and absorption spikes as indicated, although we were still able to get uh, decent fits um, that fit well to our broad profiles using these multiple components um, and we see strongly both blue and red shifted components in these. Um, and so here we can see how we have plotted the different fit parameters. So looking again at the mean velocities um, for our different transitions that we've detected on the left, our velocity whips um, in the center against that excitation temperature of our different transitions in the middle. And on the right, uh, that normalized line intensity that I talked about earlier for our blue shifted and red shifted. Um, so throughout these uh, plots, uh, the blue is for the blue shifted, the reds for the red shifted, and yellow is for our central component as well. And so here we see a slight trend um, for a decrease of our mean velocities with excitation temperature. Um, and this is something that comes up for some of the other species as well. Um, but we also see that our component strengths for our blue and red shifted components remain fairly constant across the different excitation temperatures and the drift different transitions that we were looking at. Uh, going on to SIO as another example. So of note, uh, we were actually able to detect a maser in the Onsler 20 meter observations that we have um, as indicated here. Um, and as I forgot to mention this earlier, the purple is just the overall uh, component fit for all of the three Gaussians together. Um, so here we see again the different fit parameters. Um, this includes uh, maser lines, uh, which are indicated by the star. And here we actually see enough scatter in our mean velocities, but overall we find that the mean velocities actually remain constant with excitation temperature. Um, so there's not this overall trend of things gradually getting narrower with those higher transition lines that we're detecting. Moving on to SO. So here again, we see a good fit for three different components. Um, and you can see that the different components, actually sometimes the blue and the red shifted components in fact, dominate over the central component for SO as well. And going on to our fit parameters, we find that for SO, as with some of the other species, our mean velocities do decrease with higher excitation temperature, but our component strengths um, remain constant. And so we believe that we really are, even for our higher excitation lines, tracing these directional outflows that we expect to be present as well. And lastly, I just wanted to highlight, as we also had a wealth of lines for H2O as well. And again, we had occasional complications from ISM absorption in our line profiles, but we're still able to get decent fits. And we had some lines for which we had masering action going on as well. And in fact, for our maser uh, lines that we were able to detect, we could then compare these to previous observations of H2O and SIO masers, and we found that although the maser lines themselves uh, could have a fairly consistent 
fit in their parameters of their blue and redshifted components to what was found previously in the Zhang et al. 2012 paper, overall our thermal molecular line emission uh, fit parameters for these in terms of the central velocities of our blue and redshifted components um, have a wide range and so don't have any obvious consistency with uh, the previous maser emission seen around the star. And uh, just of note, we do find consistent behavior for both our ortho and para water lines when we are able to look at um, observations of emission lines with similar excitation temperature. And again, for this, we do actually find mean velocities remain constant with excitation temperature. But of note, they have um, closer in, so smaller absolute velocity mean velocities compared to the uh, center of the line profile when compared to things like CO where you are tracing the more extended regions of the wind and the circumstellar environment. So just with my last few minutes, I want to mention, as I said earlier, um, in terms of overall trends, several of our molecules, including ones that unfortunately for time I wasn't able to present here, do show this uh, general trend of our mean velocities of both these red and blue shifted component fits that we have actually do decrease and get closer in uh, to the center of the line profile with excitation strength, indicating that they are actually tracing inner regions of the wind when you get to higher excitation transitions. Um, but also for our CO, SO and SO2, we found that the velocity widths show an unexpected increase in the redshifted component at higher transitions, but this is likely due to limitations in our fitting approach. Uh, and just a mention of some of the other limitations that we came across when using this first look fitting approach was obviously we're using this non-physical large simplification by using just three Gaussian fits together. Um, but also some of our trends are very light on a small number of data points, um, which I actually didn't show here, but for several of the molecular species such as SO2 on the SIO isotopologues, so 29 SIO and 30 SIO, we only have uh, two or three data points because there's so few lines that we had available uh, detected around the star. So we really do need more uh, lines and more transitions to do a more in-depth approach. Um, but actually this whole study actually motivates the need for spatially resolved observations in the first place so we can better determine the regions that we are tracing um, depending on the different molecular species. And of note, we always need to be aware that optical depths um, and the effects of those are going to be present, especially for species such as CO. So just to quickly summarize, um, we looked at a spectral survey scan of NMLSIG um, using long wavelengths at millimeter from 68 to 116 gigahertz, from which we were able to detect 15 uh, new detections of emission lines for 10 molecular species and isotopologues. Um, we found that from these line profiles, actually there is clear evidence for multiple components in the outflow, and this really motivates a need for um, better understanding in what's going on around these red supergiants, because clearly it's not just a spherical outflow, there's extended components, asymmetric components, there's likely complex structure, and we need more spatially resolved observations of these molecular lines to really understand what they are tracing. Um, but additionally, we need um, radiative transfer models that take full account of the 3D structure and the asymmetries. Um, and I just want to give a shout out here to Ambesh Singh, who has a poster on the NML Cygnus um, in Gava Town, poster 23, which also tries to take account of the various complex um, asymmetries and, and structure that we see. And uh, just to highlight, because um, I think I'm almost out of time, but uh, in terms of next steps, we actually were able to secure eight hours uh, on NOEMA looking at slightly higher, um, so higher frequencies of 214 to 222 and 219 to 237 gigahertz. This is very much hot off the press currently in the process of reduction and analysis. Um, so I just wanna highlight here, we have a picture in the continuum and the top where you have a central star, which is the more intense blob, but also a radio blob next to it, which we believe is a blob of dust uh, to the Northwest, which is actually uh, coincident with um, the direction in which we see maser emission and um, other uh, brightness and intensity at other wavelengths. And then on the bottom, we also have some channel maps from actually CO, J equals two to one transition. And you can see clearly that there's extended structure and also um, asymmetries and some complex structure going on. So hopefully there will be more on that later on. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for listening to my talk. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions and discussion now. Thank you.
Excellent talk. Thank you very much, uh, Holly. Uh, so I see a question by Sophia. Please ask your question. Thank you. Thank you, Holly, for this nice presentation. I'm so happy to see Unsala data. <laughs> uh, so I was uh, wondering, so I was a bit confused and maybe it's just me, but so you now have, you have fitted three velocity components to your data. And I'm just wondering, uh, do you have any idea, maybe now when you also have Noema data, of how these three components would be uh, situated in relation to each other, like spatially? Yeah, so this is um, something that was inherently part of the limitations of our approach is that although mm -hmm. um, we were able to fit the three different velocity components, we can't make too many assumptions about where they actually show up on the surface of the star. So this is definitely one of our, our major goals with the NOAMA data is to better constrain where we're actually seeing, you know, our blue shifted and our red shifted um, components with respect to one another. Um, it was just that we could tell there was evidence for these directional outflows being present in the Onsala, but there's not much more you can do with single dish um, spectroscopy, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you. So there's a question also by Anita Richards, please. Uh, Anita, I think you are muted. Yes, sorry, <laughs> thank you, Pierre. Yes, I know, I, that was a, a really amazing set of results. Um, I, I get Sandra, the token may be able to add to this, but one of the things that we both find, me with auto mazes and, and Sandra with OH maser polarization is that it has a, a very pronounced in OH um, bipolar outflow and it, indeed very strong mazes. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to reading your papers to see which mazes you, um, you, you produced, you, you, you detected. But I mean, I was also very interested that the um, increase in excitation seemed to be pretty much as one would expect for a spherically expanding envelope, in other words, more excited near the star, um, because I was wondering whether you saw any indications or signs of these, this bipolar outflow and, and shocks which it might produce. Yeah, so I think, um, unfortunately, with the data we have, we can't make too many assumptions about um, what we're seeing. But um, it's just that for some of the molecular species we see, as, as said, you know, the higher excitation transitions do have uh, closer into the star, but some do remain constant. Um, in terms of bipolar outflows, I don't think we have any obvious um, evidence for that just from this set of data. Okay, the ones that remain constant sound interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. I don't see other questions at the moment. So thank you again, Natalie, for this very nice presentation. So thank you very much, Miguel. Very, very spectacular images. Thank you. So um, our next speaker is uh, Marcus Witkowski, uh, who will uh, uh, tell us about the mass loss from red, red supergiant from interferometric imaging of the surfaces and the dust formation zones. So please, uh, Marcus. I don't see Marcus. Ah, good, thank you. Do you see the screen? Uh, As a presentation, yet. Oh, okay. yet. yes, perfect. Okay. Yeah, so well, thanks a lot uh, to the organizers for organizing this nice conference and for giving me the opportunity to talk uh, about this topic. It's about investigating the mass loss from Myron stars, but mostly the supergiants today. Uh, and in particular using interferometric imaging of stellar surfaces and dust formation zones. Uh, most of uh, what I present today is um, based on work in collaboration with the people uh, mentioned here. Um, uh, so um, there has already been a lot of introduction to this topic, of course, so I can be brief. Uh, basically, what we are interested in 
is uh, looking at these phases of high mass stars and low mass stars, where the star is at the cool end of its track. So the red supergiant and the red giant phases before they then evolve to supernovae and planetary nebulae. Um, there are different open questions. Uh, um, one is how is the atmosphere elevated, in particular for the red supergiants? Uh, are there physical processes missing in our current models? Which is the dust condensation sequence? How does it depend on the type of the star? Uh, how is the mass loss rate related to the stellar parameters? Uh, which is the composition of the dust? Uh, and also, which is the effect of close companions, but which I will not be addressing today. Uh, for these kind of questions, we need to investigate the regions close to the stellar surface where the mass loss process is uh, initiated. So if we look at a sketch of such a star, um, so we have the stellar surface surrounded by a molecular uh, environment and then the dust formation zone. Um, and uh, as we have just seen by these uh, fantastic results of Betelgeuse, uh, the inner part, the photospheric region, can be resolved by uh, AO-assisted instruments uh, such as SPHERE, but only for the very largest stars um, like, like Betelgeuse. And these are very few. Uh, if we want a larger sample, we need optical interferometry to uh, resolve these uh, regions. And uh, at the VLTI, um, we can do this. There are uh, four instruments in operations, which is Pioneer in the near infrared H band, Gravity in the near infrared K band, and Matisse in the thermal infrared LM and N bands with different spectral resolutions. And the VLTI allows us to use either the four uh, big telescopes or for this kind of research more suitable, the 1.8 meter telescopes with different configurations. Um, there's a dedicated imaging scheme available. All of these instruments combine four beams uh, and we can get uh, spatial resolutions uh, between about one milli arc second in the H band to about 10 milli arc second at the end of the N band. Uh, and we need to compare observations uh, to models to get new insights. Uh, there are 1D and 3D models available. For the 1D models, we have been using the Cortex model series by uh, Ireland et al. for MIRAS, which are based on self-excited pulsation models. Uh, they use a simple description of dust, but which is not yet sufficient to drive a wind for the oxygen-rich MIRAS. Then there are Darwin models uh, available that Sarah Blatt uh, introduced on Monday. They include frequency dependent radiation hydrodynamics and the time dependent description of dust condensation and evaporation. And in fact, there are different dust models available. And this is also needed because both Myras and Red Supergiants, they show different, in their spectra show different um, Dust, dust species. So some have a very narrow silicate feature at 10 microns and some show a much broader uh, feature. So there must be different dust compositions in different kinds of uh, targets. Then there are 3D uh, RHD simulations by uh, Bernd Freitag and which together with the Optim 3D code from Andrea Kiawasa, we can also extract interferometric, spectroscopic, photometric or astrometric uh, observables. So this is also what we are using. Uh, dust is mostly not included in these models, although uh, there's one, at least one model, maybe more in the meanwhile, uh, where, where dust is already included. And there are new developments coming from the x wings project where Susanne Höfner uh, is a PI. So if you would like to constrain such models with interferometric observations, I believe there's two good ways to do this. One is to do imaging to constrain the morphology um, and to do uh, careful comparisons to the observations. And uh, like the pioneer instrument in H is very well suited to resolve the stellar surfaces. And then Matisse in L and M uh, to look at the extended molecular environment and Matisse in the N band to image uh, the dust zone. Um, and it's also good to do time series, which is more constraining than a single snapshot, because there we also probe the time variability um, of, of, um, of the features that we observe. 
So it's easier to find a model that matches a single snapshot, but it's more difficult that the models also describe the right uh, time scales of uh, variations. And this is something that I believe can well be done with the gravity instrument in the cabin, I will show. Um, yes. Um, so going, before I show images, going back a bit. So for Myra's task, we compared uh, interferometric data, which is the visibility. Uh, here in the K-band uh, with uh, Ember still to 1D and 3D models, where you see the 1D models here in blue and the uh, 3D models in red. Um, and they both describe the data uh, quite well. Especially they reproduce uh, the drop in the visibility in the CO band heads, which indicates that the CO uh, forming layer is uh, lying on top of the uh, photosphere, like a two stellar radii. And both of these kinds of models um, describe it similarly well. Um, and it also shows that uh, shocks induced by uh, convection and pulsation in the 3D models are roughly spherically expanding and are of similar nature as those of the self-excited pulsations in 1D models. Um, so here are some uh, intensity profiles, which I think is nice to look at. So on the left, you see the intensity profiles from the uh, codex model in, in blue, and then in red of a 3D model compare so in, two, uh, in three bands here, in, in water vapor at two microns, in a near continuum band at 2.25, and in CO. And you see that uh, in the near continuum at 2.25, uh, the intensity drops sharply at one stellar radius to almost zero, whereas in molecular bands like in, in water and also in CO, you see that the intensity profile drops at this uh, same radius, but then has the extension between like 10, 20 percent up to about two stellar radii. Um, so we did the same uh, analysis this was in Berlin Arroyo Torres uh, work for a sample of red supergiants. This is one example. Uh, and here, the observed uh, extensions are comparable to those of the Myras. And the black line, you still see the sharp drop in the CO bands. But this is not predicted by any of the model atmospheres, including the 3D models or 1D pulsation models. So here you see in green uh, 3D model, and it does not reproduce this extension uh, by far. So there's different uh, ideas how this could be reconciled. One is uh, that radiatively driven, that could be radiatively driven and caused by radiation pressure on Doppler shifted molecular lines, which was proposed by Jocelyn and Platz. And if you look uh, here, uh, at this graph, it shows uh, the visibility in the continuum over the visibility in CO as a measure of the atmospheric extension versus the luminosity of the star. And across um, several magnitudes, we see that the stronger the luminosity, the higher the luminosity, the uh, stronger or more extended the uh, molecular layer. So this uh, would confirm possibly such a radiative uh, component. Also acceleration on dust grains, of course, is important. And these could maybe form closer to the stellar surface than we previously thought, uh, but still we need to uh, extend the atmosphere a bit. Also alphane wave driven winds have been um, discussed. And now with the nice results on Betelgeuse, uh, there's an, a new idea that has also been discussed also already at this uh, conference. So here's the idea is that we have discrete highly localized mass ejection events and caused by extreme photospheric motion probably and maybe enhanced by pulsation. Um, and uh, Roberta Humphreys argued that this may also explain the mass loss history, maybe even all of the mass loss history of uh, uh, VY Canis Majoris and of the supergiants maybe in general. And indeed, uh, we believe it's quite plausible that sh such stochastic occurrences of extreme photospheric motion could elevate the molecular atmosphere while average conditions do not allow so. And that might be one of the points why we miss it so far in the theoretical models. 
And this would be in contrast to AGB stars, where the 3D models do predict the formation of clumpy dust clouds on a more regular basis. Uh, and this was also observed, for example, here, the carbon AGB square R squared torus is exactly this, that we um, believe that we see uh, dust clumps at about two to three stellar radii against a stellar surface. And it's this bright uh, spot, the red one, we would look deeper onto the star, whereas the other regions are obscured. So maybe there's another similarity here between um, AGB stars and red supergiants that we still need to explain how it comes about. And then I mentioned an interesting thing is to do time series interferometry. So here we did a pilot study together with Shoya Rao uh, some years ago. Um, and we looked at the variation of the uniform disk diameter at the photospheric level, which is the blue, uh, at water, which is this light blue, and the magenta is the MCO. And there's different behaviors. Uh, the minimum continuum size tracks the maximum light, and also the water tracks the maximum light, where SCO is um, the other way around. Uh, and we can explain this. And we also reproduce this by a set of cortex models at that time. And, but of course, it was only one target, only four epochs. So we need follow up observations here, which are partly progressing um, over longer times. Uh, and this would give quite strong constraints on the time scales of the dynamic model atmospheres. We can also do it uh, more detailed using tomographic masks like Katerina Kravchenko is doing. Then I come to the uh, images of stellar surfaces. So this are uh, uh, images of the red supergiant V602K. It's about five milli arc seconds across. Uh, so it's um, like almost 10 times smaller than Betelgeuse, but we have optical interferometry, we can still resolve features on the stellar surface. So it's uh, done at two epochs, slightly apart, three years apart. Uh, and we see different features here, kind of a ring-like uh, in 2016, like a partial ring-like um, feature, and then a different uh, morphology three years later. Uh, the visibilities do indicate uh, extended molecular layers, but which we don't image well because they are kind of at the limit of the dynamic range of these uh, images. And then we try to uh, compare these to theoretical models in terms of morphology and contrast. So on the left, uh, you see on the top, the most similar 3D model that we could uh, find for the two epochs. And then in the next row, uh, it's the same theoretical model, but reduced to the uh, spatial resolution that we have, uh, and then compared uh, to, the, um, to the observation. And we find that reconstructed images are consistent with 3D uh, simulations, both in terms of morphology and contrast, which you see on the right, but the extended molecular layer is still not uh, reproduced. And we interpret the surface structure being related to instationary convection, which is then convolved to the observed spatial resolution. So each of these features, observed features, is not a single convection cell, but it's kind of more uh, global um, patterns. Uh, then I come to uh, uh, preliminary results of imaging uh, a red supergiant with Matisse on the LM and N bands. So it's AH scopy. Uh, it's uh, still uh, much smaller than Betelgeuse, for example. It's part of our um, sample that we observed before. It's uh, quite high in, uh, in luminosity compared to other red supergiants. It shows a very uh, steep uh, silicate feature at 10 microns. And we had a previous um, pioneer image, which is shown on the lower right again, uh, resolving the stellar surface. It's also about five milli arc seconds across, such as the other star that I showed. So in Matisse, we see on the left the L-band visibility and closure phase, and on the right, uh, the same for the N-band. Um, so we see water and OH lines in this region between 3.6 and 4 microns, and we see a SIO to uh, zero band, 
uh, which is extended, which is shown by this drop in visibility. It's more extended compared to the pseudo continuum before. And we also see a closure phase signal in this band showing that it's asymmetrically extended. Um, and uh, yeah, on the right, you see the N band. Here we see the silicate feature mostly in the closure phase, not so well yet in the visibility. So if you look at the images, uh, this would be an image in the pseudo continuum uh, just before the uh, SIO feature and in the SIO band head. And you see that the star is more extended in SIO and it's also more extended to the north and to the south. Uh, in this image reconstruction, it's still uh, preliminary. And here we have the N-band images from A to 12 microns, uh, where the star uh, is more compact at eight microns, mostly still in the molecular environment, probably, and then from 10 microns on, they just dominate and we see a much larger uh, star. This, of course, still has to be analyzed in a more detailed way. And if you put it together, so we have in the H band uh, the photosphere at 1.65 microns with surface structure. And then already in the L band, the molecular layer is much larger, about at least about a factor of two than at the stellar surface. And also you see asymmetries in these SIO bands. And then yet much larger if we go into the dust zone. Um, so to come to, to summarize, the details of the master's process is not fully understood and we need to resolve the photospheric region and the regions very close up close to the photosphere up to about a few stellar radii where the mass loss is initiated and this requires uh, interferometry for most stars except for maybe only for Betelgeuse really so stars like Vx Sagittarius or Vy Canis Majoris are already uh, four times smaller than um, Betelgeuse in angular diameter. Um, a good way uh, to do this is uh, imaging and time series of uh, interferometry, which provides strong constraints on the morphology and the time scales. Um, current models based on convection and pulsation alone cannot reproduce the observed extensions, can observe, uh, can reproduce them for AGB stars, but not for supergiants by far. So here we are missing something. It could possibly be radiative pressure or molecular lens or these highly localized mass ejection events as we think to see for Betelgeuse. Pioneer is an excellent tool to image the stellar surface at the photospheric level. Uh, and for this example of V602K, we show that observed morphologies and contrasts are consistent with 3D models, which is quite reassuring that up to that point, uh, we, are, we are still fine. And then with Matisse, we are now in the process of going towards the dust formation zone. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Marcus, for this uh, very nice presentation with uh, exciting interferometry results. I'm particularly impressed by the time series, which are difficult to obtain with interferometry and that tell us a lot about what's happening actually. So there is a, a question by uh, Mutlu Yildiz in the chat. Um, uh, maybe if you wish to ask, ask it, uh, Mutlu, directly. Um, or may, maybe I can, I can read it. Uh, the question is, do we know how much of hydrogen by weight is in the form of H2 at the Myra surface at, at, or at red giant surfaces, for example? I think, let me see. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay, fine. thank you. Um, <clears throat> is there another question? Yes, Anita, please. Hi, hi, Pierre. Hi. That was a really interesting talk, Marcus. Thank you so much. I was just wondering when you were talking about the difference in mechanisms between the um, red supergiants and the Myras, do you think that the cutoff is the sort of eight solar mass cutoff that we normally think of? Um, I'm just thinking of some of the low mass supergiants, I mean like sort of 10, 12 solar masses like the ex-Sagittarius, which show far less signs of having these massive dumps dust clumps 
than do monsters like Battle Girls and BYCMA. Well, yes. Uh, so there are 3D models um, down to about, uh, I think it was eight solar masses, which still do not show this. Uh, so uh, it's really about, uh, I think it's really the difference between AGB and Red Supergiant that makes the difference. Thank you. A question by Susanna. Uh, it's actually more a comment on, on Anita's question. I, I think the, uh, the, the atmosphere of the star doesn't care of what it's uh, doing in, inside, so to speak. So, uh, so, so it's more about the, the actual current stellar parameters. So, so I, I would guess there is a continuum, basically, from AGB stars to, to red supergiants. But certain processes will be more important on one end and other processes more on the other end. We just need to figure out which processes are on the extreme supergiant end uh, are the relevant ones, I think. Yes, I mean, if we see this atmospheric extension for the red supergiants, it increases very much with luminosity, with current luminosity. So in that sense, yes. Thank you. Is there another question? No. So thank you very much, Marcus, uh, for this very nice presentation. And I would have just a, a brief announcement to do. Um, there is a survey, a demographic survey that was uh, initiated for the diversity session. Uh, and uh, it would be nice if uh, the persons who have not yet filled it could fill it. So I put the link for this uh, survey in the chat. So. If you, if you wish, it takes just one minute, you can fill this, uh, this survey to improve the statistics. So thank you very much to all the speakers of this morning. This was a, an extremely interesting series of presentation. And uh, I think now we have a break of 30 minutes. So if there's no announcement by the, the persons from the lock, I think we can um, ask, uh, uh, come back in, in uh, 30 minutes at, uh, 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 0920 uh, UTC.